different tonight. And that's intentional. This is the new, more professional, slicker look. And I warn you guys, though, I haven't mastered the technology yet. I'm just a regular guy. There's nobody in the studio here making it work for me. It's me operating the camera, the microphone, the sound, the whole thing. Though we do have producer G all the way on the other side of the country in Virginia, and he is hopefully making the technology work behind the scenes. But Lord knows anything can happen. Literally, we've seen some disconnects. So if it goes dark for a second, just bear with me. We'll reboot and we'll get going again. You can see the dogs in the background. On the couch is uh, Levi and behind me over this shoulder. I don't know if you can see this. Let me see, that's Gideon over there. And you can see we've got kind of a new scene set here. This is the same library you're used to. It's the bookshelves behind me, but you also see the spiral staircase up to the second level of the library. So we just kind of wanted to have a little bit more interesting setup for you, a little bit better lighting. You know, we're growing up. We're trying to be professional for you guys because you guys are pros, so I'm trying to be a pro. All right, this week, we're going to spend a whole bunch of time on primarily one subject. I got a couple of things I want to talk to you about, but the primary subject for this week are the conventions, right? So last week, we had the DNC convention. This week, we have the RNC convention. And I'm just going to say this, it's... Madness. Now, you might have seen the topic madness, one step beyond. I got to say, producer G, he's pretty young. He had no idea what I meant by that. Some of you who are older, you might remember a band called Madness in the 80s. They were a ska band. I was a new wave guy. I was a punk rock DJ. I admit it, blue mohawk, dog color, the whole thing. Madness was one of my favorite bands, and they had a song called One Step Beyond. And I think that's where we're at, because we are sort of one step beyond reality here. It's crazy. First of all, online conventions. It's weird. You know, it's weird enough that you and I and all our friends and business associates, if you can work online, you've been probably working from home and you're doing a whole bunch of Zoom meetings or Slack meetings or Skype meetings or whatever technology you're using. And it's a little bit weird, right? It's not the same as sitting around a table with your friends or your business associates. And so it's strange. Sometimes it's a little bit stilted. People step on each other kind of awkward, people trying to be excited and enthusiastic, even though they're in a room by themselves, there's no audience reaction. It's weird when you're a speaker and you got no audience reaction, kind of like this, right? I, it, I can't tell what you guys are thinking. In a live hall, the audience cheers and claps and jeers and boos, there's none of that. So I gotta say, I have empathy for the speakers, whether they're at the DNC or the RNC to come, it's just a hard thing to pull off online, hours and hours of content live. It's funky. All right. So let's have that caveat for everybody. A little bit of sympathy for all of them. And you know, I don't usually have sympathy for politicians. So that's a little weird. Okay. So we let's talk a little bit about the substance of the DNC convention. I think there were actually two DNC conventions. One DNC convention was the one that you saw in prime time. And during that DNC convention, you saw a whole bunch of American flags. They said the Pledge of Allegiance. We heard the national anthem, a lot of stuff that you would see kind of at any political convention. It was what I would describe as the veneer of the convention. You saw even John Kasich. Unbelievable, right? I think he was a Republican at one point. Anyway, you saw it just sort of they tried to put on their mainstream middle American face. With the veneer of the convention, in the prime time of the convention, what they were trying to say to you is, hey, don't look at Portland, where things are still burning 80 days into the riots. Don't look at Seattle, where last night there was rioting. Don't look at Los Angeles. Don't look at Oakland. Don't look at Baltimore. Don't look at the places that are burning. Look here at the clown show, right? We don't want you to see reality. We want you to think that we're just like you. We want you to think, go to church, we say the pledge, we do everything you do. That's the veneer of the convention that you saw at the DNC. It concluded, and I'm going to jump to the conclusion and then work backwards. It concluded with Joe Biden's speech. And I have to say, I'm not going to be like most conservative commentators and just rip on Joe Biden. I think he stepped up to the plate. I don't think it was a great speech. MSNBC, NBC, ABC, all the BCs, they're going to tell you that it was the greatest speech of his career, that he was the man for the moment, that it was incredible and emotional, inspiring. It was none of those things. But he had a low bar. Joe Biden needed to show up, he needed to be cogent, which is something he's had a hard time doing for a while now. And he needed to be able to read off a teleprompter, which he's fine at reading off a teleprompter. So I have to say the speech was, I think, fairly well-crafted. 
I think he did what he had to do. I think he stepped up to the podium. I think he spoke clearly. I think he didn't sound like he had dementia. That was really the bar. And I think, honestly, in a way, this was a mistake by the Republican Party because the main attack on Joe Biden's been he has dementia. He's incapable. He's sleepy Joe. He has no enthusiasm. He didn't look like that at the DNC. He didn't look like that when he accepted the nomination. He looked like he was there and cogent and on the mark. The speech was fairly well written. And so I have to say, I think Joe Biden delivered. This is important. It's important because I think you and I have to be able to be honest. We can see it through a filter. Look, I don't make any bones about it. I'm a conservative Christian. I'm a Tea Party guy. I'm a right wing guy. I make no bones about that. But I also have to be able to say what the truth is as I see it. And I have to be able to strip away my perspective, right? my conservative perspective. I don't like Joe Biden. I don't like what he stands for. I don't believe he's truthful. I just believe it's all veneer. But when I'm going to analyze a speech, I want to tell you truthfully what I thought of the speech. And that's what I thought. Just basically not a bad speech. It was fine. And so that was Joe Biden. Let's talk about Kamala Harris. I think pretty much the same thing. I think she delivered a decent speech. I think she came across as likable enough. I think she stepped into the moment just fine. Again, you saw the BCs, ABC, NBC, MSNBC, all these networks, they were drooling over Kamala Harris. They were drooling over Joe Biden. It was not the most amazing speech of a lifetime. It was not captivating. It's not going to motivate anybody who wasn't already going to vote Democrat. And make no mistake, they're voting Democrat. Right? When you look at the polling, a full 57% of people that say they're voting for Joe Biden say they're not voting for Joe Biden because they like Joe Biden or because they like Kamala Harris. They're voting for Joe Biden because they're voting against Donald Trump. This really is going to be a referendum on Donald Trump. So you've got the two main speeches, Kamala Harris, Joe Biden. I think they stepped up to the plate. I would say, you know, maybe they hit doubles. No homers for sure. More than a base hit because I think they both delivered decent speeches, well-written speeches, well-crafted speeches, and pretty well delivered. All right. I know I'm going to get some hate comments for that, but that's just how I see it. And I'm always going to call balls and strikes with you guys. Remember, I look, everybody says there's two sides. I think there's another side. I think there's a new side out there. And the new side is people like you and me that are willing to actually just look at this stuff objectively and call it like we see it. So that's how I see the speeches, the main speeches at the DNC. That's what I call the veneer of the DNC. Underneath the veneer, right, is the particle board, <laughs> the garbage, the stuff that's been chewed up and spit out and glued together and stuffed underneath the veneer. It's the Bernie Sanders wing of the party. It's the AOC wing of the party. And it's full-blown nuts. It's Marxist. And there was open, look, there are people on panels earlier in the day talking about being frank that this is about tearing down capitalism, tearing down our system, destroying the system. This was openly discussed at the DNC by people in platform committee, like openly discussed stuff. This is a weird thing that was missing. Did anybody hear any mention of Portland? Any mention of riots? Any mentions of looting or violence in the streets? How do you do an entire convention when the country's burning in, in many, many, not all, but many of the major Democrat-run cities? By the way, kudos to Detroit, a Democratic-run city that hasn't let the riots run wild, run wild. But how do you go through an entire convention without doing that, without no mention of the violence, no mention of Antifa, no mention of Black Lives Matter looting and destruction? It's dishonest. See, this is what's underneath the veneer. It's the AOC wing of the party. I don't know if you saw AOC's speech. You might have missed it because it was boom. It went by. It was 60 seconds they gave her. So this is them trying to hide the radical wing of the party from the American public. One of the things she said is she endorsed Bernie Sanders, right? And this is fair. This is where she comes from in the party. I don't think it was so wild. A lot of people made a big deal out of it. I would expect her to side with Bernie Sanders. But this is now the Bernie Sanders platform. It's the Bernie Sanders party. It's the AOC party, right? So there was some weird stuff. Uh, you saw some people calling for continued violence in the streets. So you've got the veneer of the party, which is attempting to do its best to appeal to mainstream America, what they would consider moderate America. You had Pete Buttigieg saying that he was talking to soon-to-be former Republicans. Eh, not so much. I don't think there's going to be a lot of that. The party has been completely radicalized. It is Marxist. 
It is att- it's going to attempt to force the new green deal on us. They're talking about four trillion in new taxes. It is going to be painful in my opinion. So this is what we saw from the DNC. It was a tale of two parties. So it's not really united. One of the most important things that a party can do during their convention is show a united face. And while there was no serious fighting like there was in the convention in 2016, there is a clear schism in the Democratic Party. All right, so this week, we're looking forward to the Republican National Convention, the Republican Party, for those of you who are Republicans, right? In in Texas here, by the way, we don't state our party affiliation. In California, I was declined to state. I'm just not a fan of the parties at all, generally. I don't like either of them. I mean, I'm being honest with you, I would associate more with Republicans. At least some Republicans speak things that make sense to me, generally not Democrats, but I'm neither party. I'm not affiliated with the parties. But we have the Republican convention coming up. So the question is, what do Republicans need to do now? One, and I think most important, is they need to be unified. This is a big deal. Again, I said this before about the Democrats. They did a pretty good job. I think the Republicans are more unified going into convention. This, at this point, is Trump's party. At the last convention, they weren't all that unified. Remember, you had Ted Cruz get on stage and say, vote your conscience. You had people booing him. There was controversy in the party. There were people who were trying to flip the convention away from Trump. This time, I think it's Trump's party. So the convention is going to be all Trump all the time. This is a really interesting thing going on, and probably because it's digital, President Trump is going to appear every night of the convention. And I'm not sure whether this is intended to be a contrast with Joe Biden, who didn't appear all the nights of the convention, who just gave his main speech, stepped into the frame with his wife a little bit, but primarily just his speech. I think it's Trump contrasting with Biden, but I think it's also because this is Trump's medium. This is a really interesting contrast, right? Television, Biden can do it. He can read off a teleprompter, but television is where Trump's legend was made. I mean, he is a reality television star. He's a reality television host. This is the ultimate in reality television. So theoretically, not saying he's going to, he could shine. This is Trump's to blow, by the way, and it's possible he blows it because he does blow these things sometimes. By the way, you guys are going to see me look off screen here occasionally. I've got uh, producer G is slacking me your comments, so you can give your comments to him. He's going to feed them to me on Slack, but I do have to look up occasionally to look at those. Okay, so Trump's going to go out. He's going to do what Trump does. And what, if you like Trump, if you like the Republicans, you have to hope that he does what he does best on camera and not what he does worst on Twitter. The president, people don't like his Twitter. A lot of people don't like his Twitter. Now, you got to be careful. I know you're going to yell at me for this. You love his Twitter. There are people who love his Twitter, but a lot of people don't. And a lot of people I talk to all across the country say, look, I love Trump. I love what he does. But when he does the Twitter thing, sometimes eh, I don't like it so much. And so hopefully Trump does a more presidential Trump. He's really good. Like when he gave the Mount Rushmore speech or the NATO speech, He's really good in those environments. And if he sticks to that, I think it's Trump's to lose. There's going to be some good appearances. I think we've seen some good names. You guys haven't seen Kim Klasik. She's running for Congress uh, in Baltimore, I believe it is. And she's incredible, articulate, beautiful, young black woman, really well-dressed, sharp, well-spoken. She's just awesome. She's a rock star candidate. She cut an ad last week that set the internet on fire. Millions and millions of views went completely viral. So she's speaking. Uh, You've got Trump, of course, speaking. You've got the Trump family, of course, speaking. You've got Rick Grinnell, former ambassador to Germany. He was the acting head of National Intelligence Service for a bit. Now he's out on his own supporting the Trump campaign. He'll be speaking. He's a great guy. You've got a bunch of people, color speaking. Yeah, I know, but the party's going to show its diversity which I actually think is important because it is a diverse party. And so they're going to demonstrate that. I think there's going to be some great speakers. Alice Johnson, who uh, was one of the people pardoned by President Trump or was given clemency by President Trump. So she's now working on criminal justice reform at Texas Public Policy, where my daughter works, by the way. So kind of cool. So Alice is going to be there speaking on behalf of the president. I think it's going to be powerful. It has the potential to be powerful. And I think the most important distinction hopefully, that you're going to see between the RNC and the DNC is the RNC is going to be the same whether you're watching during the day or at night in prime time. That's what we're going to see 
that I think is going to be most interesting in distinction. There's not going to be anything there that they have to hide from the American people. They've got a lot of accomplishments that scream in hot economy before the COVID shutdowns. I know the Democrats seem to be trying to continue the COVID shutdowns, but the economy seems to be bouncing back. So Trump's going to take credit for that. They're going to celebrate that. They're going to celebrate what just happened in the Middle East. Incredible peace deal brokered by Trump and by Kushner between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, reshaping the Middle East. Going to be really incredible to see what happens in the Middle East. It looks like Bahrain is going to be right behind. So everybody's now aligning against Saudi Arabia. This was the Trump doctrine as opposed to trying to align with Iran and give them, uh, I don't know what it is, $150 billion to commit terrorist acts against the United States. Anyway, I think Trump's going to celebrate that. So he's going to celebrate foreign policy accomplishments. He's going to celebrate taking a tough line with China, taking a tough time line with Russia. I think it's going to be a real contrast to the Democratic National Convention. So I don't know whether you guys are going to watch. I'm going to be watching some of it on and off. I can only take so much of it. Thursday night, I'm going to be at a big watch party out in Dripping Springs, Texas. Colonel Alan West is going to be speaking out there. I'm speaking out there. We're going to watch. We're going to see what happens. Uh, so we'll be probably watching with you. We're going to watch the president's acceptance speech. And this is a big difference. There are going to be parties all across the country of people getting together in the Republican Party. You know, it's going to be shocking. They're actually living their lives. You'll probably see people without masks on. <gasps> shock of shock. I know I should be wearing a mask right now, right? I'm in my office with Gideon and Levi. So you're going to see people without masks hanging out together. I think the party that I'm going to be at, probably going to be five or 600 people there, I have to guess. Uh, undisclosed location. We don't want Antifa showing up. So we're going to have a big watch party. We're going to have big giant screens outside so people can be outside and, and distanced if they want to be. I don't think you're going to see a lot of masks there. Maybe you'll see some of the people who are in vulnerable populations wearing a mask. I won't be wearing a mask. I mean, I think it's time for back to sanity. So that's the distinction. That's my prediction for what's going to happen at the RNC this week. Saw some interesting footage this week from Trafalgar Group. Now, if you haven't heard of Trafalgar Group, they were the most accurate pollsters in 2016 and 2018. The only pollster, by the way, to call Florida for DeSantis. They had it right. They were the most accurate in regard to the Electoral College. It's Robert Cahaley runs Trafalgar Group. I know Robert. I work closely with Robert. Great, fantastic patriot. He's out there doing independent polling. He says neck and neck right now. He says it's about 50-50. And he says, just like in 2016, just like in 2018, the other pollsters have it wrong. So I think Cahaley's most likely to have it right. I think it's neck and neck right now. I think this is going to happen at the margins. In other words, who's going to get out the vote? There's a couple of ways to look at this. One is who's most enthusiastic. Right now, advantage Republicans. Right? And the Republicans say in every poll, they're more enthusiastic to vote for their candidate. However, I think there's a flip side to that that doesn't get polled, which is I think Democrats have real hate like a burning, searing, passionate hate for President Trump. And I think that's going to drive them to vote. So I think the base of the party is pretty electrified on both sides. They're both going to come out and vote. So then at the margins, what do I mean by that? I mean, people who don't normally get out and vote. Who's going to get those voters out the most? And I'm going to say, from a convention of states perspective, it's going to be up to you. And yeah, I do mean you, personally. I'm asking you to do something which we don't normally talk about during election cycles, but I'm going to talk about it now. You're going to hear me talking about it a lot. We want you to go out and get your circle of 10. And what I mean by that is you're going to go out and you're going to find 10 people that you are going to be responsible for to make sure they're registered. If they're not, you need to know how. We'll help you do that. And then get them registered and then follow them and make sure they vote. When I say follow them, I'm not talking creeper style. You don't need to follow them around, but I need you to contact them by phone, by text, by email, by whatever it takes, Pony Express, and make sure they vote. I like them to vote early. If they are voting absentee, make sure they've got their absentee ballot. I wouldn't say generally vote by mail. I don't like vote by mail. You never know if your ballot's gonna get in on time or not. If you're doing it early by absentee, get that done. And then in person, that's my favorite. Go vote in person. That's a big part of being an American citizen. So we're gonna count on you to get your circle of 10, and the report back to us that you're doing that. We'll have a program out for you shortly on how that all works in a form you can download so you can do that. Remember, circle of 10, be thinking about this, make a circle, put 10 people on that circle and count them. I wanna know that you're each getting 10 people to go on a vote and especially 10 people 
that you know kind of think like you and you don't know if they're going to vote or not. Super important that you as a responsible citizen make sure that happens. Okay, so uh, there's some other stuff I want to talk about tonight. We're going to go and do some q and I want to talk a little bit first before we go Q&A. Make sure you get your questions in. I'm not seeing a ton of questions, so I want your questions and your comments. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the cities burning. Last night, I think Portland passed a threshold, a really dangerous threshold. Like, do not pass go, do not collect $200, go straight to jail or maybe straight to hell threshold. And what I mean by that is in Portland last night, there was a face-off, a rumble between Antifa and between back the blue folks, right? And there, there were some fighting actually that happened, hand-to-hand -hand kind of combat. There were a lot of armed people there. Thank God nobody started shooting, but there were people on both sides with guns. Oregon is a shall issue state. People can carry their weapons. And it looked dangerous. And the police did nothing. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. And the police made a statement. They said they don't have the manpower to actually do anything about it. 80 days straight of rioting and looting, they're out of manpower. And so now we're at a point where essentially gangs are facing off in the streets, left versus right. I told you this was coming. Right? I just, you can go back, you can look at my Sunday night battle cries, you can listen to my podcast. I told you that eventually people who believe in law and order were going to take to the streets and they were going to fight these thugs and they were going to restore law and order. I'm not saying that's a good thing. In fact, it's a bad thing, right? There's no rules of engagement. People are going to get hurt. People are going to get hit, killed. That's really bad. But eventually, Americans who desire law and order are going to impose law and order if the authorities can't or won't. And we've now passed a red line I think in Portland where they can't, they can't do it anymore. The Portland police have been under fire for so long, under pressure for so long that they simply can't do it anymore. And so it's Portland, what city will be next? Is it Chicago? Is it Seattle? Is it Los Angeles? Is it Oakland? The city's burning, ladies and gentlemen. And this is the contrast right now between the Republican Party that's going to talk about this openly and talk about the restoration of law and order, and talk about how important it is to liberty that we have basic law and order in America, and the Democratic Party that literally winks and nods at this, doesn't talk about it at their convention at all. This is the contrast you're going to see between these two parties. There's going to be a lot of talk. There's going to be video footage, I can guarantee you, of Portland burning, of Seattle burning, of violence in the streets. I don't know if you saw the guy get dragged out of his truck in Seattle a few nights ago and beat unconscious by a mob, right? Kicked in the head. This is going on in your cities. And the question is, what will the American people choose? All right, I'm going to go to Q&A. And then after Q&A, we're going to show a quick video. I think producer G has a video queued up. We're going to talk about our constitution training. So I'm going to drag down the, the questions here. And going to have to forgive me and deal with the technology here. All right, Francesca Norton uh, says, COS team just finished entering petitions gathered at Sturgis, Sturgis Motorcycle Rally. This is so cool, Francesca. Do you guys know this? COS had a team in Sturgis at the Motorcycle Rally. That rally is filled with thousands upon thousands of patriots. A lot of veterans ride their bikes all across the country. We had COS supporters, including Dave Schneider, one of my great regional directors, rode his motorcycle to Sturgis. They collected petitions, over 1,500 petitions in support of convention estates from all over the country. Congratulations to those teams, by the way. Really incredible teams. South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming. I think people from all over participated. Great job to the folks in Sturgis. Sharon Carell says, if the Democrats win both houses of Congress and the presidency, do you think the country can recover? Look, first of all, I don't think that's going to happen, Sharon. And yes, I do still think the country can recover. The question is, what's recovery look like? You know, I think if the Democrats win both houses and they win the presidency, they are going to do away with the filibuster. I think that's inevitable. Schumer has pretty much said it. Others have said it. And that means they'll get done whatever they want. They'll ram through some Supreme Court nominees. Uh, the question is, will the conservatives hold out for four more years? I think they will. So they might be able to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, but I don't think any of the other justices is going anywhere during a, anywhere during a Biden presidency and a Democratic Senate. Uh, they will ram through some legislation, clearly, because they would have all, you know, the House and the Senate and the presidency. And no, I don't think it'll be pretty. I think they're going to limit the Second Amendment pretty heavily. There'll be a lot of lawsuits 
as long as the quote unquote conservatives, I use those quotes because they're not always conservative, but as long as the conservatives hold the Supreme Court, the lower courts have gotten a lot more favorable to originalism and textualism. So I think that's a little bit of a bulwark against the worst because there'll be a lot of litigation from the right. If we have a Biden presidency and a Biden Senate or a Democrat Senate and House, I think it'll be ugly. But in my opinion, yeah, the country survives. Look, the country's been through bad stuff. We had Franklin Delano Roosevelt, remember, he threatened to pack the court. When he did that, the court just started approving a bunch of stuff that was patently unconstitutional. The country was worse off for it, for sure, right? Progressivism rocketed forward, but the country survived. And I think the country will still survive. It's possible it's, you know, gets ugly and confrontational. We're already seeing that, but I believe the country will still survive. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. All right, Montana Galt says, how many legislatures have approved COS? Montana Galt, is that your real name? Or is that a reference to John Galt? I don't know. All right. So 15 states have approved. It takes 34 states. I think we would have got another five or six in 2020. Legislatures got shut down. We're going to get those in 2021. Going to be a good year. So we are at 15 out of the requisite 34, almost halfway there. Teresa pickens Rowland says, do you think the media will be fair with the president? Uh, no. How's that for a simple answer? No way. No chance. Uh, let's see. Susan Ohm says, if Biden wins, will the investigation into Obamagate continue or will AG Barr will be replaced? If Biden wins any investigation into Obamagate, into Mueller gate, into the fake Russia gate stuff, all that stuff goes away and gets buried in the ash bin of history. All right, uh, let's see. How do we get term limits? We call a convention of states. That's the only way we get term limits. It's part of our application. Congress is never gonna do it by itself. All right, we're gonna close with something unusual, which hopefully it will work. Producer G is gonna work some magic here. And, uh, oh, wait, real quick, Shauna says, who's John Galt? You have to read Atlas Shrugged. John Galt is the protagonist of the book Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. Okay, so producer G is going to do something we haven't done before. He's going to play a video for you because we now are offering constitutional training for you. It's coming from America's constitution coach, my good friend, Rick Green. So producer G, we've done the video. I think it's better than I could say it. So take it away. We'll close with the video. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week. Hey, Mark Meckler here, and I am with America's Constitution coach, Rick Green, at his place. You might recognize the studio. I'm not home in the library. This is his library. So the dogs aren't here. Yeah, you won't see yeah. Gideon and Levi. I didn't load them in the car today. They're a bit much. 300 pounds of Great Dane in the car. They might not have fit in my yeah, studio. Exactly. They fit in your, yeah. <laughs> so the reason we're here is because we have something incredibly exciting to announce, and it's this. For all of you folks out there in Convention of States land, you know I love the Constitution. I know you love the Constitution. And we've had a lot of requests for training on the Constitution. Nobody better in America to train you on the Constitution and also, by the way, to train you on how to train others on the Constitution than my friend Rick Green. Rick's going to tell you about what we got going. Man, I am so excited about this. Big Convention of States fan. Been talking about this for 10 years. When you started ConventionofStates.com, it's the first time I really went, hey, this could actually happen. It's not theoretical anymore. This guy knows how to put the boots on the ground. So to get the team up with you, Man, dream of mine. And we've been doing Constitution Coach for a while now, teaching people how to host classes in their living rooms, at their church, online with Zoom, getting others to talk about the Constitution and really dive into those foundational principles and understand why our system worked so great in the beginning, where we've gone wrong, and how to fix it and get this thing back to real jurisdictions, which is what Convention of States is all about. So it's a great tool that we're gonna give you guys. It's a six week class. It's really easy to host. We bring all the expertise. We actually teach the class in Independence Hall. So imagine that we're gonna be in the room where the Constitution was framed, where the Declaration took place. And we also go to David Barton's library, which is the largest private Incredible. collection of Founding Fathers documents. It's a really fun way to do history and government in, a, in an entertaining way. So in other words, it's not gonna put you to sleep like most Constitution classes. You'll actually enjoy it and it'll get your folks fired up about getting involved and being a good citizen. Well, and this is why it's so important and I can't overemphasize this. You folks are different because you're activists. You're not just sitting there on your couch watching stuff. You're not just yelling at the news. What I brag about y'all all the time is that you're out there in the field doing stuff. And that means you actually have an obligation to understand the Constitution. I know you love it. I love it too. The question is, how well do we understand it? Do we understand it well enough to teach other people? That's a big deal, right? right? Because 
government's not going to do that for us. Lord right. knows, right? We have to do that. That obligation is our obligation. That means it's your obligation. So in a way, kind of, you're almost obligated to sign up for this. And you are fulfilling what Chief Justice John Jay said. He was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, one of the authors of the Federalist Papers, one of the guys that gave us the Constitution. And he said, every one of us, every citizen ought to read and study. So it's not enough to read it and say, I love it, but read and study the Constitution so we can teach the rising generation to be free so we'll know our rights, then we'll perceive when our rights have been violated and be the better prepared to defend and assert them. That's his quote. That's really what drives the whole course, and it's why every one of us have a responsibility to do this. Just think about what will happen. You'll be the catalyst in your community. You're going to help build an army of folks that will help us restore our constitutional republic. We just want to equip you, give you the tools that you need, and we're looking forward to working with you on it. Look, and you guys have been asking us for this for a long time, literally for years. I feel a little bit remiss here that it's taken me this long to get to this. You've been asking for constitutional training. I'm kind of embarrassed to say we live an hour apart. <laughs> and <laughs> my the first time we've exactly. got together on this. Yeah. First time over here. So it's my fault. I take the blame for it. But now I'm going to pass the responsibility to you. Do what I know you do best. Be an activist. Be engaged. Get educated. Sign up with Rick. You'll, you'll tell him how to sign yeah, up? Yeah, let me just give you 30 seconds real quick. If you, if you scroll down this page, click on one of the buttons on Becoming a Constitution Coach. And it's really easy. Once you sign up, and it's totally for free, once you sign up, all the tools are right there. You'll be given a coach dashboard. And in that dashboard, all the tools are available. We take you through a quick training. It'll show you how to use the class. It gives you access to all the videos, the digital workbooks. And one of the coolest things is it'll help you create your class registration page. And it's real quick. You just do three quick clicks. Then you'll have a registration page and a URL you can send out to your friends and family. Makes it easy for them. Gives them immediate access to the digital workbook that goes along with the videos. And then depending on how you want to do it, if you want to do it in your living room or at your church or online with Zoom, or a lot of people do a combination. So they'll get 10 or 12 people in the living room, but then also have a Zoom for the people that are outside of, of that area. All of those options are available to you, and we give you all that technology. We're so excited, and we want you to use it. So just click that Become a Constitution Coach button, and then our team will come alongside you and help you host those local classes. And one of the really cool things, you're going to do this live with our team right. all over the country, right? Can you explain how that works? Yeah, so August 24th coming up really quick, so you get, got to get signed up for this, but we will be hosting a live class across the country. And actually, Jackson Allen, who's governor of our Patriot Academy and also has been staffing for Convention of States, kind of has his foot in both camps, the perfect guy to be our MC and host of this live class. It's going to happen on Monday nights starting August 24th. You can sign up. It's free. And that way you kind of go through the class with us before you coach a class if you want. Now, a lot of people start their own class immediately, or maybe you want to do one class with us, and then you'll get so excited you'll be ready to start your own class. But either way, we're going to have six weeks in a row of us doing Monday night together. We'll play the videos, and then I'll do a live Q&A after the class. That way, if you have questions, we can enjoy some time together. I'm excited about that. I'm going to participate in that live class, by the way. I know Jackson. I've had a chance to mentor him. Incredible guy. Came over to us from Patriot Academy. Yeah. Thank you very much. We've loved having him. So I'm counting on you guys. Join us for that live class. I'll be there. We can interact together with Rick. It's going to be fantastic. You're going to have a great time. And when you ask a tough question, I will punt to Mark. <laughs> well, then I'm going to fail and punt back to you, brother. <laughs> you will stump us. Don't worry. We're not gurus. We're just citizens just like you. And we want to all learn together. So we're really looking forward to that time with you. So again, no hesitation. Be there. Sign up. Join us in class. <laughs> I thought you were starting. Or my... <laughs> the, aus the auspicious that beginning. That is the perfect The Mark outdate. and Rick show. <laughs>